Seven years to become an overnight success. I love it. You'll have her. Her name is Faith Martin. Uh, she sold half a million books around the world in the last six months. And uh, she's here. Yeah. <laughs> is that Sun Kim yet? Uh, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me in, by the way. Oh, no, it's a um, pleasure. Yes, no, it, it was a very strange situation. Um, I've been writing for 25 years, but my first publisher was a, a lovely publisher called Robert Hale, who did mainly hardbacks. And his um, niche marketing was sort of libraries and book clubs and the high end, which didn't sort of sell a lot or go anywhere particularly, but it was very nice because I never thought I'd get published by anyone. So, and back in 1993, when my first book came out, there was no self-publishing industry or anything like that. And you had to go the traditional publishing route, and it could take up to six years for people to get published. And people like, you know, um, Lee Child nowadays might get turned down. You know, so many famous names went on to be really big authors mm. had struggled just to get a publisher. So when I got this hardback publisher, I thought I was in seventh heaven. <laughs> but it never sold huge about because I was mainly known in the libraries. So I used to give talks to local libraries, especially recently because they're trying to shut them down. And I hate it. The bookshops are shutting down and everything. So I knew my books were popular in the libraries, but it never sort of, you know, they never hit bestseller list because it wasn't that market. Mm. And then um, uh, last summer, this wonderful man, wonderful man called Jasper Joffe, who owns the biggest independent bookstore in the country, Joffe Books, said, um, I love your Hedy Green series. Would you mind if I bought them out as up-to-date e-books? And I don't have a Kindle. I'm, I'm, I'm a total lead on a computer. I, I, I don't even own a mobile phone. I think I must be the last person in the world who doesn't have a mobile phone. And I'm, I've never read an e-book in my life. And I, I still couldn't because I don't have a Kindle. So, you, so you, every book you write is in longhand? Yeah. Well, no, I do it on a computer. But that, <laughs> my poor long-suffering friends who know I'm a total lead have set me up on the computer. And I know how to produce a book. And I know how to do an e email. And I recently a friend, my poor long suffering friend Judith has set me up on Twitter, but I don't understand computers. I know exactly what I need to do to write a book and send it so off. So you've it. got people to do that. It's, well, <laughs> yeah, my, my staff, my poor long suffering <laughs> Your friends. minions face. Yes, yes, my minions. <laughs> Martin's <laughs> minions. Poor Judith probably feels like that, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, so when Jasper Joffe said to me, could we bring your books out as e-books? Of course I said yes, straight away, because I thought, well, it'd be a little bit more money. I could just about earn a living as well. I, what I was doing, but it wasn't sort of, you know, I wasn't touring, the, touring you know, doing doing around the world um, cruises or anything, so I had to sort of be a little bit more pocket money. So I said, yes, okay, um, Jasper, that'd be great. And he said, um, okay, I'll take the, the ones you've got the rights to, and if I don't sell, say, 15,000, you can have the rights back. So I thought, okay, that sounds, you know, sounds great, a bit more pocket money. So I, he sent me the first one in, and I had to sort of redo it to sort of... Um, bring it up to date a bit because I'd written about um, 10 years ago the first mm. Henry Green so I, I, I sort of brought it up to date to him and sent it off and just forgot about it because I thought okay that's it um, started work on my next project which is a, a book set in Oxford in the 1960s because my agent said to me retro is really in now this vintage so set of books in the 1960s I thought yes that's probably more my speed <laughs> I didn't have computers in the 1960s <laughs> so I started work on that and I just just went out of my mind and about Three weeks after the first book came out, I got this email from my agent, and she said, wow, you must be really pleased, I'm really excited. Have you seen, you know, you're in the bestseller list and you're getting all these five-star reviews? And I sort of, I looked at the email and I thought, I know, she, she sent me the wrong email because she's got several <laughs> um, best-selling um, romance novelists. And I thought she sent the wrong email to me, so I, so I, ra so I emailed her, but I said, okay, I don't think you think this is for me, this must be for your best-selling romance, and I forgot about it. But if, if, you, if you go back to think, actually, when you were writing these books, mm. and you, you sort of came up with this, your central character, D.I. Hillary Green, yeah. you know, when you were caring for your parents, because actually, I mean, you know, that that's sort of quite an, a, a important part of the jigsaw, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because you, you started life as a secretary. Yeah, yeah, and, that was and, the high point. I thought I'd never get better than secretary <laughs> work. <laughs> But that, that after six years, yeah, that came to an end. Yeah, yeah, I had to go. Um, my mum and dad had a bad car crash when I was um, nineteen, when I was studying for my um, secretarial exams, and after about six years, it was clear that they're going to need someone to look after them. So I left the job at Somerville College. I did a job in Somerville College, and um, started to care for my mum and dad. And of course, so writing was your yeah, habits. it was it was something to do. But it was I thought of it more as a hobby, really, something that pleased me. Because I'd always write stories at, at school. It's really one thing I could I couldn't do maths to save my life. I'm not, I haven't got a I've, I'm, I've got a very average brain, if that. So, but writing was always something I like doing, like somebody like painting or knitting or something. So I'd write these books for myself, really, to give but myself why, something why, to do. Why crime? I mean, I, I um, love a crime novel. I've but... always loved crime. I started reading Agatha Christie when I was about ten, <laughs> and of course Agatha Christie then takes on to all the golden age authors, and you have got people like Dorothy Sayers and Edmund Christie, all set around Oxford. 
which is the only city I knew. And so I grew up reading these lovely classic whodunits, which are lovely to read, but absolute mm, gives you brain ache to plot them because a classic whodunit, you know, you've got the you've got the clues, you've got the red herrings, you've got the amateur sleuth. You're supposed to be able to solve a locked door mystery, you know, a crime a crime that your amateur sleuth has trouble with. And I've got an average brain. I'm thinking, how on earth can I write? You know, I'm, I'm kidding myself. I can't do this. But I did it to give myself something to do, like a hobby. And it was only sort of after I'd done three or four and got a bit of practice in that my dad started to read because he was a, ma- a massive reader. And he said, you know, these are quite good. You know, you should show somebody these. And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> these um, are quite yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> right. But I did eventually send them out to um, some publishers and they could all come back saying thank you, no thank you. And I thought, yeah, that's what I thought. Stop, you know, standard rejection slips. But I, d- I noticed that more and more of them were saying, you know, this is really good, but this is wrong. Or this is really good, but you need an agent. And it sort of slowly filtered to my sort of dim brain that perhaps they were saying, you know, giving me a clue that perhaps I needed a bit of help. So I've got an agent called Dorothy Lumley, who I was with for many years. I sadly lost her to cancer a while ago before I got my other agent. And she sort of then became my editor. She said, look, it's too long. It's overwritten. Do this, do that. And I sort of... "Mm." But she said, it's good, but it's not publishable. You need to work. You need to be professional. Because I was an amateur, you know. Like anybody else, practice makes perfect. So I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. Then she sold the first book for me, which was to, um, like I say, to a hardback publisher. And for 25 years, you know, they went into the lo- local people knew me because they knew me, mm. and my people in the in the libraries knew me. But it wasn't I wasn't a famous author by any well, it, it's, by any means. It's a fantastic story, and we're going to hear more about <laughs> it. And and indeed, in fact, uh, D.I. Hillary Green will hear more about your central character. And uh, I do realise that I, I am in the company of literary royalty. No, you're not. Uh, well, <laughs> no, well, you're not. Well, I'll read your text. <laughs> oh, Faith. crikey. Uh, Dave Windercleen has been in touch, and okay. Dave says. I've read all of Faith's books. She's like a female Colin Dexter. They are absolutely fabulous. Please pass on to her how much I loved them. Great reads. Fantastic. Oh, thank you, mate. (laughs) We'll return to our conversation in just a couple of moments' time. Faith Martin. She's a global bestseller. She's my guest in the studio. You are. I mean, you know, yes, as, as yes. you said, it's taken you 25 years, but you became an overnight <laughs> success. And you have sold half a million books around the world and growing, being on those best-selling lists, incredible. But you write crime novels and you write them in the only city that you know about, which is Oxford. So mm-hmm. how do you compete in in, 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 a, in a city where, when you think about a crime novel, it's yeah. all about mobs? Yeah. Well, to begin with, Oxford's always been... Um, um, historically, a, a, a great city for literary crime novels. Before you had Morse, you had Dorothy Sayers, you had Lord Peter Winsey, uh, Gordy Knight in, in Oxford. Mm. Before that, you also had, you got people like Edmund Crispin, who wrote the classic moving toy shop set in Oxford. So Oxford's always been a literary sort of place to find literary crime bodies scattered all over the place. <laughs> a um, hot only bed, recently, but... Morse, of course, has dominated. So when my agent said to me, OK, write a police procedural because they're in now, I thought, well, the only place I could write a police procedural is Oxford. It's the only place I know. As soon as you say Oxford, you think Morse. Mm. I thought, well, I can't write Morse, you know, what, what's going on? So I sat down and I thought, okay, what what's the opposite of Morse? Well, female detectives is an obvious first thing, because there aren't that many, even even nowadays. You think about it, you think of a famous police detective, you think Sherlock Holmes, Morse, Rebus, Lee, Lee Child, somebody, you know, somebody like that. You don't think of a woman, mm. even now. Julia so Bravo. Thought, yeah, or, or, or Jane Tennyson. Mm. I see. So I thought, right, I'm going to make her a woman. Okay, what else is more snow for? Well, he's known for being the sort of um, elite sort of college person, isn't he? He, he solves crimes in the city and he's always been to college. So, well, well, Thames Valley is sitting in Killington, and that's massive. So I have a work out of Thames Valley. Okay, Morse is known to be a maverick on his own. Give her a team. So I sat down and I wrote somebody who wasn't Morse, to be, to be honest. I love the way that you work all this out. <laughs> but you know what absolutely fascinates me is how you construct a novel like this, a police procedural. Yeah. Because I, what, when, I, when I read a crime novel, I just I, I love how the plot unfolds. I, I, mm. I, I want to almost sort of get inside the author's yeah. brain as to how they kind of work it all out, how they plot it all. And whether there's, whether there's a master plan <laughs> and whether you know exactly what's going to happen, all the little intricacies. Yeah, it, it, that's very really interesting it. because I, I, I just um, about a week or two ago I, I went to um, a little local arts festival because Anne Granger was speaking. Uh, she's another crime writer and I love Anne Granger and I thought I've got to listen to this lady speak. And she says she starts off a book, she doesn't know how it's going to end and she because that way she, the reader won't know how it's going to end and, and she finds out at the end. And I sat there, my jaw was just, I thought, 
Good grief, I could never do I, I would be terrified to do it. If I did that, I would get to the end and think, ah, now, who did who did do it? And I wouldn't know. <laughs> I wouldn't have the brains to figure out who did it if I did that. <laughs> so I thought, and I was, a, I was in awe because I don't do that. I start off, if you think of a book as a spider's web, you start the book at the beginning, you work your way into the centre and you find out who the killer is and how it was done. I start in the spider's web and in the middle and move out. So I start A kills B because of C. Then I know who did it, so I'm safe. <laughs> After I've done that, I've got to figure out who else might want to kill. So you can bring in the suspects. And then you think, okay, how are they going to be killed? You're going to drown them, hit them over the head, knife them, poison them, what? And if you're going to do that, how is Hillary going to find out? So I, I start in the very middle and I weave the strands outwards until I've got the whole plot. I will then do a, a sort of timeline. So I'll start off with chapter one, so I've got a, and I'll write down all the things that's got to happen to the end. Mm. And then I can see where the problems are before I even start. So I think, okay, if that's going to happen to solve the crime, this needs to happen then. Because it's no good writing a book and getting to this bit, and then you think, I'll blow it, that won't work, because I haven't done this. So you've got to stop and go back. And that interrupts the flow of writing, and that, that does my head in. I, I can't do that. And, and, and what about Hillary, D.I. Hillary Green? Yeah. How, how did you construct that character? Um... <laughs> I thought, what are all the good things that I would like to be and I'm not? So Which she's competent, she's, really. So she, <laughs> first thing is confident and I'm not. So I made her so confident. So she's you personified? She's who I'd like to be and I'm definitely I'm not. <laughs> yeah. If I could think of all the good things I would like to be and I'm not, that's Hilary Green. That's how I that's how I created her. And you know her intimately, you know yeah, her so Yeah, I've, well. I've written 17 books so far of Hilary Green's. So when I started off when she's... The very first introduction was Murder on the Oxford Canal. When she's um, she's forced to be living on a canal boat because her, her bent husband that she's in the middle of divorcing has just recently died. And so she's not living in the family home and her uncle's led to a canal boat. Um, she's being um, investigated for corruption because her husband was, and they want to know, does she know, did she know where, where her husband's money is? So she's in a very low place at the very beginning because she's got all this hassle. And her boss assigns her the, the, a, a death in the Oxford Canal because he thinks it's an accident, somebody's fallen off a canal boat. And because she lives on a canal boat, she thinks, yeah, this will get her out of the way and give her something to do. But, of course, it isn't a mere accident. There's much more to it. And she figures this out. And, of course, as she figures out, they try to take it away from her, and she's not having it. <laughs> <laughs> and so and at the end where she is now she's gone through this whole process she's had you know money uh, her husband's stolen money has been purloined by another boss of hers and you know she's um she's she's come through the other side now but she's had to be forced to retire because of a shooting incident with her ex-sergeant and so she now comes back to solve cold cases so she's gone because if you if you write a seventeen books you can't write the same book seventeen times over. How, how have you found out about you know police procedures? Because um, you know you normally write about what you know. Yeah, no, I don't know. Luckily, there was a, there was a retired um, senior policeman in the village where I live, and I very cheekily <laughs> walked down there and said, "Would you mind giving me a few pointers?" And he was very happy to do so. Um, but really, you you say you write a police procedure, but a policeman will tell you that's not how it works. You know, they say, well, look, you have a crime scene officer, you'd have paperwork, you'd have this and that. And if you wrote a proper police, it would probably be boring, <laughs> you know? So you don't actually write real realty anyway. So, you know, so I, I write what I want to write. Well, just... I'm, I'm glad, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, you, you've yeah. persevered for the last 25 <laughs> years to become this overnight success. And many congratulations <laughs> Thank on you all very these much. successes. And uh, clearly you've got many, many fans, not just in Oxfordshire, but right across the world now. Faith Martin, what a pleasure it's been. Thank, Thank you, you very much for inviting me in.